Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. This is episode 240. This week, we have George professors complaining again, a full court press on Trump, unsent swabs, and the colorful language from an L.A. councilwoman. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my partner in this endeavor, writer, journalist, owner of the GeorgiaVirtue.com, Jessica Salaji. Hi. Hey, howdy. How was your week? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 How's your week? <laughs> you, ladies and gentlemen, you can tell she's a writer by the way she expresses herself. Eh, yeah. Oh, it was, it was chilly up here. Uh, I hate the cold. I hate winter. As we as we record, it's supposed to warm up for the weekend, which is great. I've got uh, family friends in town. We're we're gonna go go see. It's supposed to be a pretty nice weekend. Uh, I know. Once again, hint: this show is not live. Shocker. And we are recording before the senatorial uh, debate. Mm-hmm. So, we yeah, uh, we, I mean, I don't think we're, I, we're I'm going to watch it, but I don't think we're missing much on it. No. And like, what could truly change? Uh, I, don't I don't think th- any minds and hearts are going to be changed. I don't think so. Uh, again, Warnock has got great media out there. Uh, there, I know you don't watch TV, and uh, the Braves are in the playoffs, so I've been I've been watching them. There's an ad that's going during sports games, which is brilliant, and it is people in Georgia gear with pictures of Herschel Walker on the wall, saying, "I love Herschel Walker. I'm, uh, he needs I uh, keep him." And one guy says, "Keep him up there," pointing to the poster on the wall. Keep Warnock in the Senate, Yikes. and it's a really well done ad. Again, I, I mean, don't like Warnock's politics, but his ads are, I mean. His creative uh-huh. team is top notch and they've been, well, I think what's nice, you know, when Kemp had his 2018 primary ads in particular, they got a lot of attention because they, um, well, Democrats hated them because they were super far right, but also they were different and they were they were unique. They weren't just like, hey, this is me and or or here's like attacking my opponent. They were they were just unique. And Warnock is doing the exact same thing. They're not his the nuts ad and then that one. Um they're just not your your typical stereo type yeah, of a political it, ad. And early on he did this ad where He's running around track and he's like, yeah, Herschel Walker could probably beat me here. And then he's in football pads laying down like he just got tackled. He could definitely beat me here. But, you know, and it just, he comes off so charming and just so so genuine that it's hard not to like him as, as an individual based on these ads. Yeah. Now, look, Warnock does not like me. There's... He and I would not get along politically, but could I sit down and have a conversation with the guy? Probably. I mean, he seems nice enough, and I said before, he's super accessible, and especially in contrast to our previous senators uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, they would send representatives, and Warnock and and Pajama Boy will show up to stuff. And speaking of Pajama Boy, he was he was out with the the head of the uh, uh, VA in Atlanta talking about getting compensation for veterans on the the poo burning details and, and the smoke inhalation from from different deployments but he's out front with with the constituent stuff and th- th- their media team is is outstanding yeah no they um it's hard to, it's hard to top what they're doing yeah it was, it, then then you contrast that with Stacey Abrams which is just horrible ads very dated very 1990s, 1980s style ads. Uh, her from the classroom. Well, how'd you figure that out? I did my homework in the whole class. Uh, uh, I mean, her her stuff is just awful. I think one of her biggest issues is that she is not bringing anything new to the table for 2022. I mean, you, <laughs> People don't change terribly much. I mean, like, I'm sure a lot of her supporters hold a lot of the same values that they did four years ago. But um, I would, I mean, 
we've talked about this, but she had the Obama effect in 2018. People were excited about her. They were inspired by her. They wanted to hear her story. Um, and, and, and in addition to her actual platforms not really having a whole lot of stickiness to them this time, there isn't really any new story about... Um, you know, she she really took on like the bootstrap. I came from this was my family. This was my growing up. These are the hurdles that I overcame, and and I think that gave her a lot of people gave her a lot of pass on the the tax stuff because of those stories. And now she's a, a multi millionaire. <laughs> um, I don't think she's as relatable, and she's not as inspiring. And I think that's totally having an impact. Well, she's not the she was a multi millionaire before. Uh, from writing those romance novels and stuff. She was so, came off so genuine when she sat down with you and and giving of her time to come down and come and sit with you. She knew you guys didn't agree necessarily politically. She probably knew you from, from the Georgia house too, from being around. Mm-hmm. Uh, she just came, came, again, wrong politically as far as I'm concerned, but came across as this warm, welcoming person, and she's not anymore. She comes off as as an elitist. And, you know, in the ads that Kemp's people are running about her in Hollywood and her on The View saying she wants to run for president and all that stuff, and I know I've said this before, it those hits are really landing. And uh, uh, the there are, there are ads running against Butch Jones and uh, Brad Raffensperger right now. One against Brad was... Uh, he doesn't support abortion. What? He's Secretary of State. Well, he deserves that because when he ran in 2018, he touted that he was endorsed by Georgia Right to Life. And I don't really care what he believes one or the other, but he interjected that into his race four years ago. That's so, fair enough. You know, go ahead and, and attack him on it as far as I'm concerned. Only to the the thing that sucks is that people will use that as a guide and while I understand those are your values, he's not going to have any impact on it one way or the other. Um, well, but here's, he, he brought that on himself. Well, here's the problem. If they go after Raffensperger on election integrity, well, that's what the Republicans were going after him on. Well, the election came out the way the Democrats wanted it. How can they, how can oh, they yeah. hammer him on election integrity? For sure. So they can't hit him on that. So they really don't... Uh, my my brother and I were talking about um, my nephew plays plays football. It was a quarterback who is slippery. You can't ever get a good hit on him. I mean, you may tackle him, but you but he always moves to the side. You, you never get you ne- he never gets a really good lick on him because he's so slippery. Well, that's sort of that's sort of Raffsberger on this thing. They don't have a, a straight angle to get a good hit on him. That that he that he everything else is just gonna be a glancing blow. And I don't I don't see how. Raffensperger loses this race. I I I I, I just I don't, don't see either. it. I mean, Democrats by and large aren't. They're not gaining the momentum. I thought they were gonna. They. I don't think that anyone really thought that they were going to have. Um, they've. They're definitely underperforming outside of Warnock. I think he's right where everyone thought he would be. Yeah. Uh, and Jones uh, is. They're trying to hit him on being close to President Trump, and I think that's a very dangerous criticism to make yeah i think that's very very dangerous to make say that the the pitcher that is a that's the uh, lieutenant governor now isn't endorsing him it's a very dangerous way to look at it because there georgia still has a lot of trump supporters a lot of georgians are very angry about him losing especially state the, the state uh that's a day again you've got to it's like, it's like throwing a boomerang. You're throwing it at him. It comes back and smacks them in the face. Mm-hmm. So that's that wasn't actually that's none of that was part of the outline. Sorry to get off on a hog trail. No. So back on survey. Georgia professors upset with tenure changes. What are yeah. they not upset? I don't know. They have. I will give them a little bit of credit. They've been quiet her lately but there's been a lot of stuff going on nationally that other places have kind of picked up but um they made changes to the tenure process and it was uh before the 
what is it? The Board of Regents. It was uh, a change that they were pondering for some time. And it's it's about the process and then the post-tenure review. Um, and there were thousands of professors that signed a petition urging them not to do it because um, they said that it would hurt the state's ability to attract and keep talent in our universities. And, um, but basically the short of it is that, um, the tenure doesn't, it doesn't guarantee absolute job security in Georgia, but it meant that the instructors couldn't be fired without cause. Um, and the whole idea they said was, you know, of the old process was to give professors the ability to have open discourse with students without fearing any type of retribution. But they say that these new rules can change that. Um, and obviously their first criticism is that most of the board of regents don't, who are appointed by the governor, which I am no fan of the board of regents, but the, their whole point is that they're not, um, experienced in higher education and so they're arguing that they really don't know what they're doing and they're basically like tanking tenure um and i think what really exacerbated the anger about this was the rules were proposed or the rule changes were proposed when universities were going through the whole mask mandate social distancing vaccine mandate and all that um and so and obviously a lot of professors were very much in favor of those mandates, whereas our state government as a whole was not. Um, So this has been going on for over a year. Um, I think they first announced it in September 2021, but they just recently took effect. Well, you can't tell me that the professors didn't enjoy uh, being able to work from home and, and do their stuff online and still get paid like as if they were going to work every day. Uh, one of the things that they're the the dismissal hearing is is one of the sticking points on this thing. And honestly, I don't have a problem with a dismissal hearing. It, it, allow, allowing the professor to make to to make his or her case as to why or why this is this is unjust. But this idea that it stifles academic freedom is ridiculous. That's not. Well, no, yeah. I don't have tenure. I didn't have tenure when I, when I was when I was working in in corporate America. If if I had if I had a couple bad quarters, my butt was gone. Well, and not only that, but when you look at it on the flip side, I mean, professors are employees; they're paid to be there, or they're contractors. Students are paying to be there, in some form or fashion, whether. It, you know, be through hope or privately or scholarships, but they're paying to be there and their dismissal hearings, most of the time, if they're, if they're put in a position where they need to be axed from campus, they are not able to participate in a dismissal hearing or they're not given the opportunity to have one because they're also facing criminal charges or whatnot. So you're already giving professors far more, um, provisions than you're giving students on the same campuses. Um, they There was an addition of a new category to the tenure evaluation. And then they also, like, they changed the, the post-tenure um, review process to let the Board of Regents be able to step in if they thought the school's procedure for evaluating the professors wasn't rigorous enough. Um, of course, you know, The Board of Regents is an unappointed, unelected, unaccountable board. And it could be dangerous if they didn't define, you know, what it means to be more rigorous. But I don't think that like, like their opposition came out right off the bat, you know, like right when the rules were announced without even really knowing anything that were with regard to the specifics. And I think that it's very dangerous when anybody wants to have a conversation like about being held accountable and being evaluated and they're, they're afraid of more rigorous reviews. Why, why would you, why would that, you don't even know what rigorous means. Why would you oppose that? Right. And two things can be true at the same time. The board of regents could be a, a, a crappy thing with the way, the way it's put together. And the college professors could be whining and moaning 
for for no good reason. I mean, look, it, God, I I I know I. I I sound like I'm anti-educator every time, but good Lord, educators whine about everything. And this kind of reminds me of, if you ever, if you ever watched the original Ghostbusters, Dan Aykroyd is looking at, at uh, Bill Murray uh, and, and says, the private sector, you don't understand the private sector. I've been out there. They expect results. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, so it's hard for anybody who has to make their living and get, get out and work and have results, and whether whether it's a corporate job or you're digging ditches. If 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 you're digging ditches and you don't get the get the ditches done, you're fired. If if you're a division manager at a bank and your division isn't doing well, you're gone. But teachers think that they should have this immunity once they put in whatever it is, two, three, four, five years, whatever it is, that they're untouchable. That unless they, you know, what's the saying? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be in office unless I get caught with a dead girl or live boy. They just have this this think that they, they think that they're, they're immune to anything outside of criminal proceedings. Well, and I think one of the issues, too, is, you know, the, the go-to argument is, well, one size doesn't fit all. And I agree with that. I mean, that's true in every, in every sector, in every industry. And I think the, the, the difference is, is that, I mean, I'm self-employed now, you're self-employed now. So we made the decision that we, you know, for, we left, both of us are self-employed for a number of reasons among them that you say your own standards and goals and then you decide if you're, I mean, you decide if you're meeting them and your bank account decides if you're meeting them. I mean, there's, there's lots of things to when you're in, when you're in charge, but going back to the evaluations, like we've also worked for other people. I've worked a corporate job as well. I've worked for a small business. I've worked for, um, like just on, on a contract basis. I've done, I've, I've had a wide, variety of things and every job has things that you don't like about it every job every job has things you have to do that are part of the job description that you're like gosh I wish I didn't have to do this um some of those are related to your job performance and some of them aren't but like I this 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 notion that like higher education is supposed to be all the things that a person loves and none of the things that they don't. I mean, these evaluations and everything, like it's, it's the whole person. It's not just what the board of regents would, it's not like the board of regents would step in and and erase everything else you have to do. They would just say, are you also doing all of these things? Like it would be in addition to not instead of. Well, you know, it is on the heels of a story. I can't remember exactly where it is, but a teacher, a professor was dismissed for being too hard. That happens all the time. That to me is insane. And it was and it was not a it was not a creative writing class either. It was it was science related. I mean, it was like some sort of physics class or something like that. And like it's too hard. How? Yeah. I mean, look, if you're training and you know, engineering has a huge washout rate. And people just, just, you know, they think they want to be an engineer and they, they get in there and it's it's beyond just math and people wash out all the time. So there are certain disciplines where I expect professors to be harder than others. I don't want a doctor that got through because the professors were nice. Right. But that's... I, I don't know. I, that's, yeah, it's... It's not going to change. They're going to whine and moan. Part of the story is uh, I'm, I'm telling people to consider whether or not to get into higher education. You mean whether or not they should go into the real world and actually do something versus go get out with a with a doctorate and immediately go into teaching other people to get their doctorate? Well, yeah, go out and do something real. I know some really great – I mean, some of my professors – they they were incredible. They were honestly, I enjoyed the classes that were much smaller, more than the big classes because you know you really got to like get to know your professor, 
they challenged you more. They knew you as a student, things like that. And then in the smaller classes, you had them over and over. And, and, and so I, I hate, I hate what higher education has become because there are some professors that had a profound impact on me at a very, at a time when I was like, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I could be easily influenced, but cause I, I wasn't, I argued with everybody even then, but I was, no. I know it's shocking, but I think that, um, I, I, it wasn't influenced, but like they, they were, they were guiding posts at times when I kind of needed like someone to help me stay on the rails for where I wanted to go and helped me like do trial and error of things to figure out where that path was supposed to take me. And I think that that's like a really important element of college. And I mean, that's something that's really been left behind because we, we are trying to automate so much of it, like just churn people out. This is what you want to come for. This is how you're supposed to be when you get done. And this is where you're supposed to go. I mean, by the time I got to grad school, the first day of school, they gave me a book that said 10 steps to a federal job. Like they wanted everybody to end up in a federal job. That was never my plan, never my goal, never my desire. But that was the program. That's how they measured success of the program was placement at the end of the program. In fact, like that's not education. Well, that's a selling point. That's when when they go to uh, when they go to kids that are getting their undergrad and say, "Hey, come come to this program for you, for your graduate degree. Look, we have a ninety percent placement rate." And they do the same thing with 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 tech schools. Is is we have a ninety eight percent placement rate, and that's and it it's college is an industry. And it we, is. we 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 like to pretend that it's not, or they like to pretend that it's not, but it's an industry. It's more and more it has turned into at least especially for undergrad into high school part two. With alcohol. With alcohol, yes. With binge drinking. Which was I th- I think high school part one too. Uh but yeah, it's it's turned into high school part two because Kids aren't kids aren't held accountable like 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 they were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago when they went to school. Uh, I mean, when, when you went off to college, you were you know men and women, and you were expected to to uh, you were given standards and adhere to it. And, and I agree with the professors to a certain point that we've given the students way too much power, and I understand they're the customer, but also you know everybody needs to be held accountable, whether it's the whether it's the students, the administration, or the professors. Yeah, students have, I mean, the weight we, I think that you should give um, everybody's, I think you should give specific comments on an evaluation. I don't know. It's why I loved ratemyprofessor.com because I felt like that was like the perfect forum for, it, it would help students decide if that was the kind of teacher they wanted to take and you could read like diverse feedback, but it didn't impact like. I don't I don't think if I did not connect with a teacher or I did not learn well from their teaching style, I'm not sure they should be punished for that. That's not their fault or mine, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's like it's any other relationship. You may have a boss you don't click with or a company you go to work for you don't click with. Dating, that's why you date. Is you find people that you click with. You find someone you click with is you know, you go out with somebody a couple times like, yeah, yeah, this person's not for me. All right, so SCOTUS rebuffs Trump Mar-a-Lago documents fight. Yeah, so apparently Trump was looking for um, the Supreme Court to get involved and return about 100 documents with classification markings to a review process um, that a special master is conducting of more than the 10,000 documents that they took during their August raid um but no one on the court said they would offer any type of immediate relief and um i guess i guess i think it was like a a discovery tactic in that his attorneys if they would have sent it back then the attorneys would have had the ability to look at it um 
and right now only the FBI is allowed to look at it. And I think so. I think maybe it was more of like an attorney tactic to get access. But. And, and truthfully, what the Supreme Court did was say they're not going to have an emergency hearing on it. Right. It doesn't mean the Supreme Court won't eventually hear it. But based on what is what's in front of them, they're not they're not going to drop everything and address this Mar-a-Lago raid. And I'm uh, not sure that I mean, timeliness is an issue, right? So, like, I'm not sure that as it goes on, there'll be too much more. It's sort of this. This thing's going to drag out for years. Sure. But there's only so much that like the chances of the entire thing being suppressed and thrown out and then having nothing like that's almost impossible so it's that part it's not like there was like an unconstitutional we have raised the threshold for unconstitutional searches and seizures to be almost unattainable yeah the fourth amendment is takes a beating every every day you get in your car with an identifying tag on the back of it the the fourth amendment takes another beating it's 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 a meaningless uh, uh, amend, amendment now. The the Supreme Court has gutted the Fourth Amendment, it, and it's taken two hundred years, but they've gutted it. the The idea that you're going to be prosecuted based on documents that your defense team can't look at is absurd. Well, they're not saying you can't look at them. They're saying you can't look at them right now, which is normal. I mean, you don't get discovery until the investigation's over and the dis- right the investigation's- yeah until there's an indictment. Well, yeah, I mean, in in Georgia, the, most people don't know this, but in Georgia, the statutory re- requirement is is only um, ten days before trial for them to give you everything. <laughs> well. Like, I mean, so, and in, in the feds do things a little bit differently too, but I mean, you can sit there and be indicted facing charges and have no idea what evidence they have against you for a year or two. Yeah. And that's, and that's problematic. Absolutely. That's absolutely problematic. Uh, no one cares because it's Trump, first of all. Uh, as soon as you, as soon as somebody sees Trump's name on something, they immediately go into their team corners. If you're team Trump or if you're team anti-Trump and everything is viewed through that lens. And that's a problem. What, what we need to be looking at, especially with, with any legal process is through, through the lens of ethics. Mm-hmm. Would I want this happening to me? No, I totally agree with that. I mean, y- I don't often see Donald Trump as a victim, but in this situation, he is because people people think like, oh, well, he has money. It's no big deal. Mm, that's incorrect. People who – everybody, whether you have money or no money, whether you're white, black, rich, poor, a jerk, a, not a jerk, a woman, a man, you everyone has the right to have a process that is um, constitutional and sound, and we don't – we are, as a society, we are terribly guilty of saying, well, I don't care what happens to them. Yeah, I hope they guy. throw the book at him. Yeah, because of their charges or because of who they are or because of who they know. And that's that's why our system is so – that's why prosecutors and um, government agencies get away with the stuff that they do because they know the public sometimes doesn't care and they're banking on people not caring. Yeah, and it justice is supposed to be blind. It doesn't matter if it's Donald Trump up there or if it's Dave Roberts. You're supposed to have the same protections under the law, equal protection under the law. And just be, just because you don't like Donald Trump, you know, look, there's there's a lot not to like about him. I mean, he's he, he's abrasive. I mean, he's a New Yorker. I mean, the fact that a that an abrasive New Yorker uh, in 2016 carried Georgia the way he did uh, it, it is amazing because you know there, there's nothing there's nothing Southern about him. But yes, he's he's rough, he's abrasive, uh, but 
you have to take all that and throw it out and say, should any individual have his home raided in, in that way? Should any ex-president be be hauled hauled out hauled before Congress in the in the uh, uh, January six hearings? Is is that is that the way we treat you know former leaders? Is, is uh, I, I think this and the next story have uh, all about destroying his ability to run again in two years. Mm-hmm. So speaking of the next story, uh, Attorney General Tish James asked a state court. Thursday to freeze the Trump organization's New York assets. Again, um, if you're against civil forfeiture, if you're against seizing people's assets before there's a conviction or a court adjudication, you should be against this. Um, this is obviously not about him personally, like with politics or anything. This is about the real estate I mean, obviously, like you said, it's all kind of combined. Like, there's a reason that attention was drawn to him. But specifically, this one is about his real estate efforts. And um, his the allegations are that he overvalued the portfolio by billions of dollars. Which everybody does. All right. If, if you're if you're looking to get a, get a uh, refinance your house, if you're looking to refinance your house and they ask you, what's the house worth? You always shoot high, always. If if mortgage companies let people give their own uh, values on what their house is worth and didn't send an appraiser, everybody would say their house is multi millions millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. That's why they send appraisers. Everybody does this, and, and just the fact that it's done on a large scale and corporate, it's it's that company's opinion of what their assets are worth. Any lender or any anybody in any investor does his own due diligence as to what this is what's the value of of this asset before lending on it or investing in it. The fact they're singling out the tr- Trump organization has a lot to do with the fact that it's Trump. If you don't think Bloomberg has done the same thing, you're out of your mind. You know, when this was I was reading this story, um, Obviously, we've talked extensively about what Miss Willis is doing in Fulton County. And then, um, obviously, like the January 6th stuff and the FBI, the the raids of the documents. I cannot even fathom what his legal bills are right now in the like just in terms of consults and his family and just, I mean, just so many irons and different fires and so many different places. Well, you, you, he's going to have a general counsel. He's going to have federal attorneys to handle, to handle one thing. Uh, and those attorneys have to have security clearances. So those are high dollar attorneys. He's going to have to have not just a member of the state bar uh, of New York, uh, but somebody who's familiar with all the financial laws of New York, a team there. So every state that that does mm-hmm. this sort of stuff, yes, it, I, I really think it's a full court press, so to speak, to to damage his ability to run for office again, either by reputation or hitting him so hard financially that he can't afford to run again. Yeah, it's just a, it's a lot. I mean, just knowing what I know about what people have to pay for things that are considerably less. I can't, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars for each. To defend yourself in state court from DUI. uh, $10,000 in Atlanta. 10 grand is is the, is the number that I've always been told. It's probably up now with inflation. 10 grand. And that's in state court. That's a misdemeanor. I can't. I can't, I can't afford to be not guilty in federal court. I can tell you that. Right. And, and you know, this is what leads a lot of people to pleading out is they're fine. They're drained financially, and a lot of these cases that that you cover, you talk about the damage these people that that 
were found not guilty. The financial damage that's done to them and their families to be found not guilty is devastating. Well, I mean, the the blessing that Donald Trump has right now is that he hasn't been formally charged with anything in this in the context that, you know, he's out on bond or he's behind bars waiting like he he's still working. He and he also has people. He has this this enterprise where people can continue working even if he was behind bars, like even if it got to that point, his machine can keep operating. Most people don't have that and they lose everything. Yeah, and, and well, an important thing to realize also with this is Trump Enterprises and Donald Trump are two different entities. Dr. Cool and Dave Roberts are two different entities. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I have 100% control over Dr. Cool, but we are two different entities le- legally. But yeah, they're they're everything they're trying to 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 destroy his ability to run again. It's the same thing with dragging him before the January 6th hearings, which last thing I read about that is Trump was looking forward to testifying, and I'm sure he is. There's nothing he likes more than having every camera in the room on him. And he'll probably have fun with it. Hell, I'd, I'd love to be told to testify before Congress. I'd pick up a, I'd pick up a contempt charge, but I have a lot of contempt for Congress, so it's probably appropriate. Mm-hmm. This is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find relevant stories over at the georgiavirtue.com. All right, Jessica, the mule of the week. The mule of the week is the district attorney in the OPT Judicial Circuit, Ms. Daphne Totten. Um, if you know me, you know that I'm no fan of her. She's Jackie Johnson Jr. Um, and unfortunately she doesn't see that as an insult. Her words, not mine. Um, but this week she is the mule of the week because we, I I mean, we've talked on the show extensively about the cases that have been prioritized for prosecution over the ones that have been waiting. And I'm pretty sure we talked about the fact that there was a case that was at risk, um, last or it happened in August where we found out that the key witness in a murder, like an actual witness to the murder, um, was dead. He'd been dead for 11 months and the DA's office didn't know about it until a day before the calendar call. Well, that was pretty awful. Um, continues to be awful because the case is still pending. It's awful for the accused too. Um, because that person sat in jail but, you know, that we, I mean, it's just the same old stuff. However, this past week, we found out that um, another case is in limbo, another murder case. And it is also one that happened in 2020. Um, and it was a dispute between the, they, they had a, a there was a woman involved. Uh, it was in her fi- her current fiance and her ex-husband. And the ex-husband was the father of they had a shared child together. So um, they met up one evening. There was a. a scuffle and one of them ended up shot and dead well that was in october i want to say it was october 27th of 2020 it was finally scheduled for arraignment or i'm sorry calendar call jury selection and trial to happen in over the next couple weeks and the day before they were set to appear again the state announced that they were going to be asking for a continuance because They didn't have evidence back from the crime lab because the swabs from the firearm um, had never been sent off to the GBI crime lab for analysis. So for two years, they've just been sitting somewhere um, having been unprocessed. And the reason that that is so problematic, particularly in this case, I mean, we don't know all the evidence that is going to come out, but we know what's come out so far because there was an immunity hearing. And in that hearing, there was an argument over an actual argument in court over whether or not the person who's been charged with murder um, was the aggressor or was defending themselves because both men met up to, you know, sort out some issues. And so I don't want to speculate about it because I don't, I don't have enough facts of the case yet to, to make those allegations, but 
it's disgusting that evidence in a murder trial has just been sitting in a locker somewhere when um, you have a family who wants justice. You have a man sitting in prison or in jail um, waiting for two years. Yeah. For two years and nothing like And, you know, every case is important because every case is dealing with somebody's ultimate freedoms and liberties. So, I mean, there's no case that is more valuable than or more important than the next. But the stakes are higher, obviously, when as the sentences increase, we presume that there is... um, more victim or more victim oriented, you know, I mean, when we talk about like rape and kidnapping and, and then murder, I mean, you're escalating, you're, you're talking about the most severe consequence on a, on a a victim and the most severe consequence on the accused and the person charged. And so I would expect that you would send off something from a firearm in a murder case before you'd send off some weed or some ecstasy, or a substance you found in somebody's wallet, um, so that you know you can prosecute them for possession. You know, uh, we in this country generally don't support the idea of snatching somebody off the street and throwing them in a hole forever, and that's what's happening right now with these cases. Oh, it's awful. He was snatched off the street. And thrown in jail, denied bond, and denied his his right to a speedy trial. Mm-hmm. Well, and and then the DA's office, like all the other DA's office, DA's, like all the other offices of district attorneys in the state, they have the cover and shield of tolling thanks to COVID. You know, the legislature gave them a pass for two to three years. Um. Because of COVID. So like all these speedy trial things are just kind of out there in the distance too. It's just the whole thing. It's just, it's all awful. And she's the mule of the week because I am, I am desperately looking for something that she has done correctly and I can't find it. And that is well, pathetic. And two years of sitting in an evidence locker, I think gives the defense. Now, if this guy is guilty, and they and this evidence gets thrown out because it sat around for two years and they can't prove chain of custody. That's gonna. I mean, can you imagine? Well, it, it, I don't. I, again, I, I'm with you. I have no idea what happened. Have no idea if the guy's guilty. But when you let evidence just sit on a shelf for two years, it's that's a lot different from having a process, sending it immediately to the to the GBI lab, having the data back and it sitting for two years because the data doesn't change. But to have to have these swabs sitting sitting in evidence for two years, that's problematic. And yeah. we find this with, with sexual crimes all you know all the time. You get that you get that evidence processed right now. Right. So yeah, it's just it's more of the same. It's um it's upsetting because it's a miscarriage of justice for everybody. It's not you don't have to be anti state, anti police, pro criminal like it's none of that it's it's a miscarriage of justice and it's a disservice to everyone it's a disservice to the taxpayers and there's been so many things that are have been pointed out and called out that have been done wrong and and mishandled that you would think that even if you didn't want to ever admit it that they would um at least make a concerted effort to do better and be better and that's not happening and that is why she's the mule of the week and that goes back to the conversation earlier about the about the pr- professors. No one is holding anyone accountable. Right. You know, the, you know, these DAs aren't being held accountable. Unless they're on tape for, for four hours making sexual advances to their victim's advocate, Dick Donovan. I would argue that that was not accountability, though. What happened to him? No, it was not. And it, it took forever. Nobody, nobody was happier about COVID than, uh, than Dick Donovan. Yeah. All right. So speaking of mules, we have the L.A. City Councilwoman uh, has her recordings leaked. These recordings are uh, a year old. Behind closed doors, L.A. uh, City Council uh, President Nuri Martinez 
nice. made nice. made openly racist remarks uh, uh, derived from some of her, uh, some of her council colleagues and spoke unusually crass terms about how the city should be carved up politically. I mean, so for for the importance of this conversation, she is a Latina. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get get that out. She, uh, uh, I mean, not unusual for LA, but uh, this is a female Latina. Not that there are any male Latinas, but you never know with today's political correctness. She's super pretty too. Yeah, uh, but her comments the, were the, very ugly. Oh yeah, I mean, look, she, she's she's uh, she's attractive on the outside, not necessarily on the inside. Uh, she. Uh, she, she's something else. Uh, the conversation remained private for nearly a year until the recordings got leaked, and this is this is this is the problem when when you make when you talk like this. But, but even even if she thought that she had a sympathetic ear, you don't. The I, things she said are I I don't know. Uh. I don't think she and other Latino uh, uh, leaders present uh, during the taped conversation were seemingly unaware or they didn't care. They were being recorded. As Mayor uh, Martinez said, white council member handled his young black son as if he were an accessory and described uh, Councilman Mike uh, Bonin's, Bonin's son as <sighs> parece changuito. Or Little Monkey. Yeah. And those are direct quotes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't know where to go with that. It's one thing to say that another politician is using his, his children as a, uh, uh, as a prop. That's, that's... It's unkind, but I we I feel like that would be something that you would expect from somebody who's trying to say that you know you're exploiting your kid or what you know whatever the it yeah and 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 it, and it happens and you know uh, every time I, I see a campaign flyer go out and you've got the guy running for office and his kids and his wife and everybody's smiling and it's like man just or they're all wearing the I, same shirt uh, those those the Christmas photo looking things. Ugh. Of course, I'm not. I am not a fun person. I'm funny, and I'm I, I'm not silly. So I don't like the the matching shirts and and all that stuff. So, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a policy. You and Connie guy. don't go somewhere and wear the same stuff. She will coordinate us. Well, that's different. She will absolutely coordinate us, and she will. Uh, she'll pick out if we're if, if we're going to an event. She she will pick out which shirt and tie I'm wearing with what suit that goes with her dress. But no, we we don't go on vacation saying Robert's vacation 2022 and and all that. I I think <laughs> I think I think Kid Poland got got suckered into that. <laughs> uh. Ken, who's been on the been, been on the show before. Yeah, I. Th- I, th- I th- I I have family that does that, but I'm not part of that faction of the family. Yeah, I don't need that kind of family. No, my my, my brother and sister-in-law do take a Christmas photo with everybody in pajamas every year. And I'm like, whatever makes you happy, but... That's fine, too. And and it's not even the... I mean, the vacation shirts are not even it either. It's because... It's supposed like a lot of times it's just supposed to be something that's fun or a way to commemorate it or whatever. Or sometimes you just do a silly photo. But when you're running for office and people, you people, everybody knows it's so yeah. obvious when someone's doing I know. it. it del- yeah. it's, it's different. That's what I was, we got off on a hog trail. That my thing is, I just want to see your policies. Yeah. I don't care if you're married. I don't care if if your kids love you. I don't care if your kids hate you. What are your policies? But yeah, this was this was uh, certainly unkind, and that's where her mind went immediately. Was was to was to go to Chongo. Uh, 
that kind of tells you where her, her heart is because that's the first thing she thought. She didn't stop there either. No. Uh, described him as a little bitch. And that is a direct quote. Uh, she, she also was, that, mocked, that was when she was talking about... Um, was that the same guy who's... She she wasn't talking. Well, I guess she was talking. She was talking about the that wasn't about the son. She was talking about the dad, the councilman. Yeah, the Bonin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she also mocked Owaskins, Owaskins, uh, talking about the L.A. District Attorney uh, uh, George Gaston. F that guy. He's with the blacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Her apology was horrible, too. She said, In a moment of intense frustration and anger, I let the situation get the best of me, and I hold myself accountable for these comments. For that, I am sorry. The context of this conversation was concern over the redistricting process and concern about the potential negative impact it might have on committee or communities of color. My work speaks for itself. I've worked hard to lead this city through its most difficult time. I think she should have left off the, the last part. I mean... Just say sorry. Don't be like, by the way, I'm super. I've been super, and I'm going to keep being super. <laughs> she just... Oh. I don't know. I'm it's... sorry you were offended. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so hold on. Time out, because there are times when people say... When people say something generally like when 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 if she would have said something about um it would have made it okay but if she would have been speaking generally about like groups of people um i don't think first of all she would have offended more people but what she 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 didn't i think she offended people but what she did to her fellow council member was what was disgusting and disturbing. And I, I think it's beyond offense because she, I mean, she was being specific. Um, I think it's a little bit different than just speaking nasty racist comments. Generally, I don't think one is less appalling. I just think it's just different. Well, I think it's pretty, pretty appalling when you go after, go after a minor. Right. I think it's fairly fairly appalling when, when uh, and look in in Spanish, uh, particularly in uh, the Mexican dialect, chango or chanquito, which is just little, uh, and then you put ito on his little. Uh, it it is it is the same as as dropping the n bomb. Because mm-hmm. uh, there is no direct translation for that in, into Spanish. So you, you, using using chango is an n bomb uh, in in Spanish. So it's the the direct equivalent of that. So if you if you take that translation and you and you change it from you know change it and and put that put that in there, that is is the heart of of the statement. And it is wholly inappropriate to go after a political opponent's children to begin with. But to go after him in such in, in such a personal way, and it's she's not she's not young she she's not I'm, I'm saying she's not young she's from her picture she's probably my age I don't know exactly how old she is she's old enough to get the societal reference to that term. It's not like she came out and said, "Oh, I was more talking about making his son perform tricks or whatever." No, that's not what she was talking about. Uh, it's not, it's not, this is not some 20 year old that doesn't have a frame of reference for, for that term. Uh, she knew exactly what she was saying and then backed up with the, the comments about Gaston, uh, Bascon. Uh, and look, the, the LADA is a turd, uh, but she didn't go after him for saying he's, he's not prosecuting crime in our city. Uh, this is why we have, uh, we have, 
a, a huge rising crime rate is his office is doing this, this, and this. And that's not what she said. She said he's with the he's with the blacks. Mm-hmm. So it's well, not his policies. No- is, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, the whole us versus them, I mean, as if L.A. really needs any of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like L.A. has a history of blowing up into race riots. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. It's just awful all around, really. Um, If she has the tiniest iota of 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 honor she'll ju- she'll either resign or not run again don't 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 endorse anybody walk away yeah she said she's not stepping down and even after joe biden has called on her too which i think is totally inappropriate i mean I'm sorry. Yeah, he. I don't. I yeah, don't. Has, just like I don't want Trump meddling in my elections. I don't. I don't want. I don't want Joe Biden dabbling in local politics. Like he's got enough. Just worry about yourself. City councilwoman, stay in your box, Joe. Yeah. Oh man. I. 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 I I just don't get it. I, I, I don't get even even if the recording is even if the recording is not going, are those appropriate comments even behind closed doors? Absolutely not. No. And to say, well, I didn't know I was being recorded. Oh, I wouldn't have been a flaming racist if I knew I was being recorded. Right. Yeah, that doesn't make it any better. So Jessica, do you have any closing thoughts? Um well, Early voting is starting, and I just want to encourage you to not do it. Um, vote on Election Day. Be American. It's pretty huh. much it. Mm-hmm. I will be voting early. Well, yes. Surprise, surprise. I don't like early voting. If if uh, if early voting did not exist, I would be voting absentee because I just I just won't be I just won't be here on Election Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, it is, I, I'm with you. It is, I, I don't, I don't like early voting. And I told you that the only other time I early voted, uh, I was, I was supporting uh, Fred Thompson for, for president. And by the time the <laughs> actual voting day came around, he'd already dropped out of the race. Right. So, so my vote, my vote was gone. I mean, so, so I'm like, well, hell. Excellent. <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> and I was supporting an actor. So, I mean, what year was that? Was that? 12? 2000. It wasn't 12. It was 2000. I don't know. I, I think I... Clowns. Yeah, that's, that's when, that's when uh, W won. But yeah, I was supporting Fred Thompson. And and, and look, I, I, I like Senator Thompson. I... I uh, I thought he, he uh, uh, was a was a reasonable guy and and would have been would have been a, a pretty good chief executive. Not that W wasn't, just that was my preference at the time. Of course, or, I was not going to vote for Al Gore. What? Oh, you hard to believe, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't get to vote for any of them. I my first election was oh eight. Shut up. The first person I voted for president was was uh, Bob Dole. Yeah. So I turned to eighteen in nineteen ninety five. Yeah, ninety five. So was the ninety six was my first the first uh, presidential election I voted in. I know you were in elementary school. I was in first grade. Opposed to elementary school. <laughs> I just want so, to clarify, on that, it wasn't fifth grade. Thank you very much. Thank you. I <laughs> said <laughs> four years makes that much big of a difference. Uh, so on that note, thank you very much to Eric Cumby, our editor, who takes uh, absolutely awful audio and makes it something that is uh, you can listen to. Big thanks to my partner in this endeavor, Jessica Salaji. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week.
catch me hollering at the moon.